Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another weekly used gun review for you. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store, either through the front door or through our website, and give you guys about a three to four minute review on each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, webuyguns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website at webuyguns.com and create an account. You could then submit your firearms for an offer request, which we will provide to you. And remember that those requests do come to you with a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you to your local gun store to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you are unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us as we do back up our offers. All of our offers will come with a printable shipping label, so we take care of all of your shipping fees and getting those firearms to us. And we will then pay you either via a check or ACH payment to make the process as seamless for you as possible. Remember, go check us out at webuyguns.com. Getting into this video, remember the format as we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. In our number one spot, I have a Turkish Mauser model M38 chambered in 8mm Mauser. Now the history with these rifles would actually start back in the late 1890s when the Ottoman Empire would decide to go with the variation of the Mauser, which at the time was made famous by the Germans with the adoption of the Gewehr 88 rifle, which was a design by Peter Paul and Wilhelm Mauser. Now, this sort of stylizing of the Mauser, the very elongated look, would stay with the Ottoman Empire or Turkey uh, until its you know, final design culmination, which would basically end up here on the so-called M38 Mauser design. Now, this differs from the earlier versions as there was a cha change to the rear receiver bridge, as well as the bolt itself, and is not interchangeable with earlier versions of the Turkish or Ottoman Empire uh, variant of the Mauser, which would usually have a, a larger magazine, a magazine cutoff on the receiver, uh, things like that. Now, even though Turkey would not really have a lot of prevalent use in World War II, of course, they were deployed in, in certain regions, and in fact, the Turkish military would be really pulled in a lot of different directions due to the sort of the global conflict effects of World War II. Uh, they are still relegated as or determined to be in you know, a World War II type surplus uh, firearms if you are looking to round out a complete uh, World War II firearms collection. For example, this one was actually manufactured in 1942 by the uh, K. Kale plant. Um, of which I believe that there were two basic factory, two manufacturing plants. There's not really a whole lot of information on these Turkish Mausers out there. Now again, chambered an 8mm Mauser, feeding from an internal five round box magazine. And of course, like the name would suggest, uses the famed Mauser action. Now, although other countries that would employ versions of the Mauser would end up with a smaller and simplified version or more of a carbine length like the German K98K, Spanish FR8, you know, post-World War II, yeah, the Argentinian, the Mexican Mausers, uh, you know, in the, the Turkish Empire, they did basically, uh, like many others at the time, would adopt and stay with a larger variation of the rifle, kind of keeping it to its traditional, uh, you know, ancestry of the Gewehr 88. On the surplus market, these are not overly expensive. You could get something like this, all matching in good condition for about the $400 mark. So again, if you are looking for an authentic World War II era Mauser, that's maybe a little bit different and unique from most of the Mausers you see out there on the market. A Turkish Mauser, again, with a similar stylizing of the Gewehr 88, you don't have like roller coaster sights or anything like that on it, is a really good option. So definitely one I recommend taking a look at to round out any surplus collection, again, especially from the World World War II era. But anyway, there is our number one spot, the M38 Turkish Mauser, 8mm Mauser. Okay, up next I have a pretty interesting shotgun from kel -Tec. This is the kel -Tec KSG, most specifically this is the KSG-25. Now, the traditional kel -Tec would come onto the market in about 2011. Now, a couple things that make this unique is it does feed from a double magazine tube system. So you can load both of your magazine tubes accessible through the rear here, giving it more or less a bullpup type of design. Uh, and then you have a toggle switch right here so you can toggle between your two magazine tubes. 
The benefit of this is you can actually change up the ammunition types that you are loading, whether it's lethal or non-lethal, whether it's Bach or slugs or game loads, uh, rock salt, you know, anything like that you want to put in there, bean bags. So kind of marketed to or ideal for a defensive use or a police, uh, you know, law enforcement type of application, which I'm not sure any uh, law enforcement, uh, how much law enforcement use that these have seen. You do have an aluminum, mostly aluminum and polymer construction with steel in the places it needs to be, like in the bolt, the barrel, things like that. Now, even though it is a double magazine tube, it is a single barrel. So with each shot, you're not toggling between two different barrels. You are just able to toggle between two different feed sources or your tubes. Um, so uh, it is, a again, a pump-action shotgun. Now, the KSG-25, which this is, is just elongated, which gives you not only a longer barrel but longer magazine tubes. These actually fit 24 rounds, 12 in each tube, uh, plus one in the chamber, giving you a total of 25 rounds if you top it off, giving it the name the KSG-25. Traditional is 14 in one, as the name would suggest, seven rounds in each tube. I believe that's based on two and three quarter shells. Um, now, one of the complaints I hear from people on the KSG, especially the the earlier variant, the, the shorter, the, I should say the shorter variation of it, is the recoil. Now, keep in mind on a pump action or a locked breech firearm, um, whether it's a rifle or a shotgun where you have to manually operate it between shots, you do have no gases being reverted to cycle the action that you would have on a semi-automatic. Therefore, all of your recoil is coming in a rearward motion towards you. Now on the shorter barrel variation, it is a pretty lightweight package with most of your balancing right back here at the end, which is traditional on any type of bullpup configuration. So you are getting a lot of that uh, movement or that, that momentum from the recoil back into your shoulder, which gives you that heavier recoil impulse. Uh, I imagine here on the larger variation, it is this actually does have quite a bit of heft to it. Uh, recoil is probably going to be better, but of course that comes with a longer and a heavier package. Um, really, really cool. You do not see too many of these. Now, kel based down in Florida, is a small manufacturer, and they tend to tool up for single production runs of their products, making other productions or other variants of their, or other models that they produce harder to find when, they're, when they are currently in production of one type of model. I think some of their firearms, like maybe their PF9s and things like that, they keep on a, a full-scale production. I'm not too sure. But I do know as a dealer, oftentimes, even under normal circumstances, it's hard to come across KSGs or uh, PMR30s or SU22s or CP33s just because they don't put out as many of their, those products as other manufacturers like Smith & Wesson and Ruger are able to produce. Now, price point on these, typically new on the market, and I'm going back sort of pre-pandemic uh, pricing. They, they would typically be about eight, nine hundred dollars But I am seeing the Keltec KSGs top up over a thousand, you know, eleven, twelve hundred dollars up there tops uh, on a lot of the products. At least that's what I'm seeing on Gunbroker and other places. Now that's on the 25. I don't know what the difference really in the pricing between this bottle. I imagine this is a little bit higher just because, again, even though it's already a hard firearm to find, uh, the KSG 25s, I've not seen too many of. In fact, this is the only KSG 25 I've ever, ever had in stock. But it is a very unique and interesting design, which is very much in par with what Caltech really does. They really break the mold of traditional firearm function uh, designs and lines and that sort of thing. So really, really cool to get that in. Caltech KSG Model 25 or KSG 25. Okay, up next, we have an interesting shotgun that actually comes to us from a viewer and a user of WeBuyGuns.com out of Wisconsin. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is an Ithaca Model 51 Featherlight. Now, Ithaca is a company with an interesting history. They do exist today and they're based in Upper Sandusky, Ohio, but they spent most of their manufacturing past in New York. Now they would be famous for creating uh, or basically taking up expired patents from Remington. We talked about that when we were looking at the Remington 870, I believe it was in last week's video, with the Ithaca Model 37. Now this is probably one of their most fam uh, famous shotguns that they had put out. It's a pump action shotgun and has, you know, been used by hunters, enthusiasts, sportsmen for, you know, in America for a very long time. And the Ithaca Model 37 even saw some extended military service to limit ex extent as well. Uh, Ithaca did have military contracts with things like the 1911A1 in World War II, the M3 Grease gun. Um, but they are most commonly found, you most com commonly find their firearms on the sporting market, mainly in a shotgun configuration. Now, again, they are not too well known for their semi-automatic shotgun designs of which the Model 51 is one of them. Now, this would come onto the scene, and the numbers aren't really clear on this, but this would come in in about the 1970s. Now, interesting enough, at that time, Ithaca had actually come under new ownership 
And around that time, they had actually become a publicly traded company and they came out with a, a public option on the New York Stock Exchange, which actually did not go too well for them. Around that time, that's when they came out with this. Now, there's no documentation to really uh, assert that they came out with this to make themselves a more marketable company. And, uh, but there were in the 1970s a lot of other really, really well-known semi-automatic shotguns out there on the market that already had a really good foothold with shooting enthusiasts. The M51 was not that much cheaper than a lot of other things that you could purchase, but on top of that, it really had much of an early demise because it was not known for its reliability and would often find parts breakage, which has also kind of hurt its value on the, mar on the market right now. Now, uh, Ithaca would file for bankruptcy in about 1985 and then restructure again under new ownership and begin production again in about 1987. And that's when they would discontinue the Model 1951 or the Model 51. Um, so obviously they were not seeing a lot of great sales with this product. When the new ownership took over, they decided to go on with their traditionally better selling lines and get rid of the M51 altogether, which has actually made it. And so they, they were produced for maybe about 10 to 15 years. Again, production numbers are are not that solid on the market right now. Now the problem with that is that there are Ithaca collectors and these are not too common. So there is the kind of the rarity aspect of it, but also the parts are nearly impossible to find. So if you were to get one and break something, it's really hard to find replacement parts for it. Um, right now on the used market, you're typically finding these depending on conditions spreading between about $300 to $700. Uh, something like this is well worn on the finish. The finish is kind of turning a plumish color. There is a stock repair or crack, I'm sorry, right here on the forend. Uh, this is definitely something that's been taken out and hunted with and stuff like that. So, you know, price point is something like this, maybe four to $500 is all. Um, so still a really, really cool shotgun with somewhat of an interesting time period as far as Ithaca history goes. So to, again, shotgun collectors and Ithaca enthusiasts, uh, the M51 is always one that people are looking to sort of fill that spot in the collection. Not so much as something as a shooter or something to take out hunting, but as something as somewhat of just kind of a nostalgic Americana collectible shotgun. So there is that, the Ithaca M51 Featherlight. Okay, up next is another interesting pistol that comes to us from a viewer and a user of our site based in Ohio. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a Zestava CZ999 Compact. Uh, this one chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson. Now, if we go back to the Cold War, this is a Yugoslavian firearm. Yugoslavia adopted the M57 as a Yugoslavian variation of the famed Tokarev TT-33 pistol that was manufactured in Russia, chambered in 762 by 25 The difference on the M57 mainly is it did have an extended grip with a magazine capacity that added one more over the traditional uh, uh, TT-33 design. Now, as was common in the Cold War uh, with a lot of the comm bloc countries, a lot of them did adopt Soviet-type armaments like the SKS, the AK, and of course the TT-33 Tokarev or the Makarov pistols, which of course similarly were adopted by and large by uh, Yugoslavia as well by somewhat of their own variants. They would do little design changes here and there on their products, but by and large they would use the SKS, the AK, the TT-33, etc. Now, in the 1980s, as a lot of countries, especially in Europe, were thinking about adopting their own armaments, so too would Yugoslavia start designing their own service pistol, uh, which they would begin designing in about 1989, and by 1990 have this one uh, developed, the, what was known as the CZ-99. Now, a lot of people would wonder why not the CZ-89. Uh, people speculate that that was a typographical error on an order form or maybe done by an engraver, so there's really no real good reason as to why it was known as the 99 and not the 89. Now in 1990, this would make its way over to the United States and it would be premiered in SHOT Show and actually gain a lot of interest by the U.S. commercial market. Of course, as the U.S. commercial market is interested in most things military and police from foreign and domestic manufacturers. Um, one other thing that gained this a lot of attention is it was a economical version to most as a SIG P226. As you look at this, you can tell it looks or it took a lot of design inspiration from the 226, or this one specifically, the 229, as this is the compact. Uh, the military variations were meant to be chambered in 9mm, but they did make an export model known as the CZ999, uh, which they would manufacture in 9 and 40 Smith & Wesson. And this one is a 40. They would also make the 999 Scorpion, which was uh, meant to basically be like the 
a traditional military 99 except it was a little bit longer because it had an extended beaver tail and the frame was a little bit thinner. One of the things that uh, consumers on the commercial market complained about is the traditional uh, CZ model 99 had a little bit of a wider grip frame which was uncomfortable by most people especially with smaller hands so they would thin it out a little bit making it a little bit more ergonomic for most. Now the Scorpion variation was very interesting as it had two ideal features or the 999 specifically. The 999 would implement right up here a button where you could toggle between single action and double action similar to some of the design features you see on things like uh, the CZ model, uh, I'm sorry not the CZ but the Walther model um, P99 if I'm remembering that right. The P99 also the uh, Canik has a, a, a similar feature on one of their p uh, pistols as well. Another thing it had is right over the grip panel is it had a round indicator, a little kind of a, uh, a button that would pop out when you had, I believe it was three rounds left in your magazine. Now, when they would go to the Scorpion variation, they would delete those features, uh, and then they would come out with the, the compact version as well, which did not have those features as well. So this would have the features of the standard 999, which was a little bit longer because of the beaver tail and a little bit thinner than the traditional military variation, but would lack the low round count indicator on the side, as well as the double single action selector on the top of the pistol as well. This one is ported. What it also has similar to a SIG P226 is it has a, um, single double action or a decocker here on the side. Now, unlike the SIG 226, the, the uh, decocker lever also works as a slide release. So you use that to drop the slide, you use it again to drop the hammer. Uh, the SIG 226 would actually have its own switch for each uh, operation there on the pistol. So really, really nice design. So in about 2008, these would be imported mainly by Charles Daly. And then in 2013, Century Arms would take up as the main importer of these pistols and they are still imported today. Now the price point on these is typically around the four to 450 mark. Um, and there's not much I'm seeing of a variational change in terms of the size and the caliber. So, you know, they're, they're going to hover again around there in about the 400, 450 mark. But anyway, a really, really cool pistol. Don't see too many of these come in, but they're actually not too difficult to find on the market. So if you do like the idea or the concept of a SIG 226, this is a good affordable way to get into one. Or if you are a military arms collector and you want something that was actually used, adopted, and is still used by Yugoslavia, uh, this is a really cool one as well, except you would probably want the full size nine millimeter uh, to be more in accordance with what they use as the CZ Model 99. So anyway, there is that for you, a CZ 999. Okay, up next is a really cool rifle, if I can figure out how to open it. Made by PTR Industries, and this is the PTR 9R, which as you can see is really a copy off of the famed HK MP5. Let me bring this out here for you. Oops. So the PTR 9R, the R is the rifle variant, which has the shoulder stock and the longer barrel profile. Of course, gotta be a length of 16 inches to meet with compliance. I'm not letting it be a pesky uh, SBR. Uh, and then they make a pistol variant as well with no stock on it, but you can get a brace and then there's no barrel here. Now, PTR Industries is a pretty interesting history that's pretty much intermingled with HK and a company called JLD. So if we go back to the 1980s, HK was actually importing a variation of the, of the uh, HK-91, or it was actually called the HK-91, but it was the HK-G3 rifle called the HK-91 as an uh, export from HK into the U.S. consumer market. Now, due to the assault weapons ban and the importation of the sporting clause bans, uh, they could no longer come into the country. So a company by the name of JLD, and about this was about the year... Uh, I want to say the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, went over to Portugal and purchased tooling and prints uh, from an arms manufacturer in Portugal, which were basically, it was a licensed armaments manufacturer from the HK plant to come up with a newly manufactured, U.S. manufactured and compliant uh, version of the HK-91 or the HKG-3 which they did, and in every way it was identical to the HK-91, except for it had the band compliant features like no bayonet lug and things like that. Now in 2005, now this is one year after the sunset of the assault weapons ban, uh, JLD was purchased by PTR, which exists today, and they would manufacture, and what they are really known for is making the PTR-91, which is a direct, exact, 100% clone and copy of the HK-91. In fact, all the parts are interchangeable, and even the furniture that comes on a lot of their rifles is surplus HK. 
HK uh, furniture as well. And uh, for a time, they were using surplus HK parts in a lot of their builds and things like that as well. Now, a few years ago, they would come out with the PTR9, a variation or a copy of the MP5. This was, I want to say about... SHOT Show, SHOT Show 2017 or 2018 is when it would have been released. Prior to this, the only clone of the MP5 was the Zenith Manufacturing Firearms, which had a price tag of about the $1,500 to $1,600 mark, which is about where these have been since they've entered the market. Brand new, they're about $1,500. In fact, some places even have them in stock brand new today, and that's about what they go for. Use something like this in great condition, probably $1,200, $1,300 respectively. Now, the MP5 itself is a design that's been around since about the 1960s. And if you want to say there's one firearm that is out there that is probably the most iconic and the most noticeable, maybe other than the AK, is probably this. The MP5 has been used in video games, movies, pop culture, all over the place, and is one of the most collectible and desired uh, firearms platforms that is out there on the market. For example, you can on the market today get transferable MP5 machine guns, and even though there are a pretty good amount of them, either whether it's a sear gun or an actual, you know, original HK MP5, they're going to run you between about thirty to forty thousand dollars. In comparison, something like a Mac 10 runs you about six to seven thousand dollars, or an Uzi is about thirteen thousand dollars. There's probably as many MP5s, either again complete guns or sears, uh, sear host guns, as there are Uzis and the price is quadruple what an Uzi would go for. There's just, that's how much desirability there is for this package. So when PTR came out with this, of course, they got a lot of uh, interest. HK themselves have come out with a commercial version, but those are like three to $4,000 on the used market. Uh, there was talk about Palmetto State Armory coming out with a clone of this. So there's a lot of co companies coming to market with a copy of the MP5, and this is definitely one of them. But one interesting thing, though, about PTR is they do have a pretty long history of working directly off of both HK tooling and prints and, uh, you know, working within the HK design parameters of their products, which they've been doing since 2005. So I think it's kind of if you don't want to go with a actual HK uh, design and built variation, commercial variation of the package. PTR is probably the next best thing, especially for the price point. So anyway, really, really cool uh, package. Really happy to get that in. And functionally, I mean, everything works exactly how you'd expect a, a semi-automatic MP5 to work. And the full autos work under this similar principle. It is a closed bolt, direct blowback operation. So anyway, really, really cool. There is a PTR9R. Okay, up next is a beautiful revolver from Smith & Wesson, and one with an interesting history. This is the Smith & Wesson Model 57, and this one is a no-dash, which would have come onto the market in about 1964. Now, if you guys have remembered from previous videos, we've talked about the name Elmer Keith, who was an influential wildcatter when it came to trying to come up with an interesting load concoction where he would take pre-existing cartridges and try and overload them uh, and to overstretch their ballistic uh, abilities which would usually lead to the, to the development of new rounds. This is essentially how the 357 would come about. Now, Elmer Keith had sort of lamented over the gap between the 357 and the 44 Magnum. Of course, if you look at the two different loads, there is so much, uh, somewhat of a differential between the two in terms of their ballistic performance and their power, and he wanted something that would break the gap between the two. Now, he would solicit Remington to come up with a new loading, which they eventually would uh, in about 1964, known as the 41 Magnum, and they would come on board with Smith & Wesson to come up with a revolver that would introduce the new load, which was the Model 57, which you see here. Now again, coming onto the scene in 1964, this would be introduced in a four inch, a six inch, a six and a half inch, and an eight and three eighths inch, which is what you see here. It was also offered in a bright blue polished finish and a nickel plated finish. And this is of course the bright blue. You had your nice uh, checkered wood grips. You had the orange insert here. It did have a six round capacity on the cylinder and it was on the famous Smith & Wesson in frame. Now, if you are familiar with Smith & Wesson revolvers, you're going to notice that this is very similar looking to the very famous Model 29, which was, you know, presented or, or made popular by the Dirty Harry franchise uh, used by Clint Eastwood. Of course, double single action. This is a wide target spur and a wide target trigger as well. Um, the Model 57 did not actually go too well in the commercial market. Now, the 41 Magnum was really intended or what was hoped for by Elmer Keith is that it would be the new perfect police round. Um, 
he had wanted it to be named the, the uh, 41 Police, but Remington wanted to go off of the fame or the acclaim of the 44 Magnum, and they named it the 41 Magnum, which is in part one of the reasons it didn't do too well. So if we look on the police market, really at the time there were a lot of departments that were still issuing the Smith & Wesson Model 10 and the 38 uh, Special, and some departments that were going with things uh, like the 357 Magnum, but when it came to wanting to get into something like a 44 Magnum or a 41 Magnum, a lot of departments considered that overkill as it wasn't necessarily uh, enjoyable to shoot because you had the higher pressure rounds, you did need a larger, heavier frame. And there were some issues with some of their officers qualifying on the heavier, more difficult to shoot and control round like a 44 Magnum or a 41 Magnum. Now I know the 41 Magnum is not a 44 Magnum, but when they did come out with the name the 41 Magnum, it was leading a lot of police departments to believe that it was a large, heavy, powerful load that was going to greatly exceed the pressures and the handling of a 357. when in reality, uh, the 41 Magnum, in terms of felt recoil, is not that uh, much more stout than a 357 load. Uh, but anyway, so the, so the marketing or the branding of the name was part, part of its demise. Now, if we look over at the commercial market, the commercial market did have a little bit more interest in the Model 57, but also at the same time, the Dirty Harry franchise was coming out and the Model 29 had a lot of interest with the public. And when it came to getting an in-frame Magnum revolver, everybody wanted the Model 29 and 44 Magnum. So it kind of left the Model 57 with a little bit of a difficulty in terms of gaining sales or any type of market presence or recognition. Now, they would end production with this in 1993 with the 57-4, and then restart production again in 2019 as part of the classic series with the uh, 57-4. Uh, I'm sorry, they would end it in 19... I don't know if I said that right. The 1993 with the 57-4, rebegin it, in 2019 with the 57-5, which is where they're producing them right now. Uh, of course, this is a no dash, so this was made between about 1964 and 1980, which is when I believe they went to the dash two. So anyway, a very, very interesting firearm. A no dash like this with the eight and three eighths inch barrel in excellent phenomenal condition. Really, the pricing is about the $1,200 mark. Now, if this were a 29 in this condition and this early, you might be up worth of about close to $2,000. So that's the, the the difference in the uh, the desirability between the 29 and the 57. But uh, they did come out with a more economical version known as the Model 58 some years later, uh, which also did not see that great commercial success. But anyway, it's still a classic collectible revolver and is still one that any real uh, you know devoted Smith collector would want to add to their collection especially with the 8 and 3 8 inch barrel, which is not as commonly found as some of the other uh, barrel links that they had put out on the market. But anyway, just a beautiful revolver. Really, really happy to get this one in. All right, up next is a very popular rifle that a lot of you will recognize. This is the FN SCAR 17S, the semi-automatic version of the Military Mark 17 SCAR, which is the Special Operations Combat Assault Rifle. Uh, which would be chambered in both 5.56 and 3.08. Now, the 5.56 version was the Mark 16 as adopted by SOCOM, United States Special Operations Command. And the Mark 17 was the 3.08 version, which is where you get the civilian variations, the SCAR 16S and the SCAR 17S. Also, other names would be the SCAR Light and the SCAR Heavy, the light being the 5.56, the heavy being the 3.08 for obvious reasons. Then there was the Mark 13, which was a special grenade launching uh, module uh, developed for the SCAR platform as well. Now, SOCOM would put out a solicitation for a new modular rifle, which they called the SCAR program, uh, which would es essentially be won by this product put out by FN and would be adopted by SOCOM in about 2004. Now, it would go through some several design changes. They would end up dropping the Mark 16 variation as they did not find through testing that the 5.56 variation really performed or offered a lot more than, than did the M4A1 variations or the HK416 that was already in military service at the time. So they would drop that and then stick with the Mark 17, the 308 version you see here, and then the Mark 20 or the SCAR 20. Uh, which was the semi-automatic longer barrel variation used as a designated marksman's rifle or the special purpose sniper rifle, if you will, um, which there is a civilian variation of as well, which was issued out or came out into the market in about 2019. 
If we're looking at the price point on these, uh, new and used is not a very big differential. You're looking at about new normally is maybe about the 3,500 up to four grand lately since you know the market has been a little bit crazy. Uh, used, we're seeing them in about the low to mid three, so by maybe about 32 to 3,500 dollars. Uh, on the used market. Now this one, of course, an excellent, I believe, unfired condition in its original box. It'd probably be about, you know, $3,300 to $3,500 again right there uh, in there. Now this operates off of a short stroke gas piston and it has two rece uh, receiver assemblies, the upper and the lower, the lower being a polymer and the upper being an aluminum alloy. Uh, also known for having the, the famous Ugg boot side folding um, stock. I can get this to work, which of course you can achieve because there is no use of a buffer tube system. A lot of people will look at this and say, oh, it's an AR-15 variant. It really isn't. It's really completely its own design. Um, the SCAR series of rifles, they are, I do actually really like them. If you've never fired one before, especially in a 308, they weigh in about the eight to nine pounds uh, range. And for the lightweight of this, actually the recoil uh, impulse, the recoil mitigation is actually excellent. You really feel like you're shooting a really smooth, very light recoiling firearm, whereas the military variation, which fires at about 600 rounds a minute, um, is actually, I've never fired one full auto, but from what I understand, actually very controllable in 308. Um, as you do have the modular profile uh, or the modular platform this was intended to be used as somewhat of a squad automatic rifle a dmr or an infantry rifle reducing the armament requirements for the special forces that would be employing this in you know sort of an isolated combat scenario uh where you can issue these out to everybody in the the squad and then you know everybody could sort of take on multiple roles as the need would necessitate that they do so so just kind of an interesting platform really really cool and of course because they have been featured uh heavily in pop culture and video games and movies of course the desirability for these as well as the price tag is really up there so just a really really cool rifle i always enjoy getting scars in i've had a few of them in new and used over the years uh, but it is not a product that is really put out there on the market too heavily by fn so uh, not too often do you really find these in every gun store you walk into but when you do they are pretty cool um, for what they are in terms of build in and material and cost you know there are a lot of other things you can get into for the three thousand dollar price point that might do as well or better than the scar but again i believe a lot of that price point has a lot to do with sort of its mystique and nostalgia to a lot of people wanting to add it to their collections just because of its you know again huge notoriety out there on the market and in pop culture so there is that the fn scar 17s okay last but definitely not least is a really really cool rifle from larue tactical uh this is the larue, the larue lt10 now this rifle comes to us by way of a viewer as well through our website from a gentleman down in florida so thank you so much for getting this in he and i kind of chatted back and forth on this one and we kind of joked that yeah this was absolutely going to end up in a number eight spot on the video uh which he uh, said he was interested in seeing so uh, this is definitely one of the coolest uh, precision rifles I've ever seen and definitely the only one we've ever had in here. Now I personally do not know much about LaRue Tactical and there really isn't a whole lot about the history online. This came in a couple days ago and I tried to do some research up on it for this video but I really could not find a whole lot so I invite any of you who might know more about LaRue Tactical uh, to leave some information down below. I would be really interested to read that as well as the previous owner. Uh, if you're down there in the chat uh, you know definitely leave some information if you can. I'll pin it up to the top to kind of fill in the, the holes here. Uh, the company is uh, founded and is still owned and operated by Mark LaRue, who is still very intimately involved with the production of his firearms. In fact, this is the final test target after this was assembled. It was mounted with this specific uh, optic on this mount. In fact, even notched for the placement of the mount as this does have a QD uh, mount on it. And signed off by Mark LaRue himself, showing his group at 100 yards with 168 grain FGMM ammunition. Again, this scope is named on the target at 100 yards, and this target was produced in 2017. So really, really cool. Um, you can get these still brand new uh, built like this. I do understand that the wait time on something like this for a new one is about six to eight months. Uh, and it does have a new price tag of about $3,200, uh, roughly in there, th I think $3,000 to $3,500, depending on the configuration you get. And that's base price just for the rifle. You add a scope and a mount and everything, the price is going to go up. Uh, when it comes to precision rifle shooting, I have not seen a lot of LaRue Tactical rifles on the market, but I have seen their mounts. So this is probably one of the things they're most famous for is their scope mounts. They are rock solid. They keep things from moving. They are a little bit pricey for what they are, but they're really, really good quality. 
Uh, I have bought a lot of precision rifles from people over the years, and I do routinely find the Rue Tactical mounts on those rifles. Especially the good thing about the QD mounts is it is good to have a QD mount for obvious reasons if you want to ditch the scope or remove it, replace it on something else, anything like that. Uh, a lot of oftentimes, unless you have a really high quality QD mount, you don't want those arms to open up on you while you're shooting or for you to lose zero. Uh, but the LaRue Tactical Quick Detach is definitely regarded by the sort of precision community as being one of the best you can get on the market. So they are really well known for their mounts. I imagine the rifles are you know very uh, nice as well and are highly regarded. The precision uh, market, the precision rifle market, it's not really my uh, personal interest, so I do not know, again, a whole lot about these, but I definitely wanted to take this opportunity to show off what is undoubtedly a really, really just beautiful, uh, you know, AR-10 precision rifle built by Mark LaRue, LaRue Tactical. So really, really, really cool. Really glad to get this in. I'm happy to end this video off with this, the LaRue Tactical LD-10. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also hit that subscribe button and bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content as I do post these videos every week. I'm gonna leave you guys off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.